4 o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. This is Transportation Committee Chair Deb Barber. It is Monday, December 13th, 2021. Before I call the meeting to order, I would like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us to alter our usual procedures. Due to the ongoing pandemic, Council Chair Zelle has determined that it's not reasonable or prudent to conduct in-person meetings at this time. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this Transportation Committee meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021. Because we are conducting the meeting electronically, all votes must be taken by a roll call. Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. And with that, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Cummings. Here. Ferguson. Fredson. Gonzalez. Here. Sterner. Sterner. He is online, but it looks like he's having a connection issue right okay. now. Uh, Zirin. Present. Barber. Here. Uh, having a quorum present, I call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Transportation Committee for December 13th, 2021. Um, our first order of business is approval of the agenda. Did anyone have any changes or additions to the agenda? All right, seeing and hearing none, we can um, approve that and we're moving on to approval of the minutes from the November 22nd, 2021 meeting. Did anyone have any changes or additions to the minutes? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. This is Sterner, I'd make a motion to approve the minutes. It's Zarin moved by Sterner. Seconds. Seconded by Zarin. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll please? Chambliss, Cummings, Aye. Ferguson, Fredson, Aye. Gonzalez, Aye. Sterner, Aye. Zirin, Aye. Barber, Aye. And the minutes are approved. Our next door of business is the TAC report, and we have, I believe David Fenley has joined us this evening for a report. Uh, good morning. I mean, I'm sorry, afternoon-ish. I was gonna say evening, and then I was like, no, it's not the evening; it's the morning. Good, good afternoon, um, um, uh, Chair Barber and Council members. David Fenley here, uh, Chair of the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, a couple updates. First off, we are well on our way to uh, making uh, our required 2022 appointments. We have four folks who have um, either been reinstated as incumbents. Um, or or new folks. It's not official yet from from chair Zell, fr from the chair. So I don't want to 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 drop any names quite yet. But we're well on our way for 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 that to be um, uh, released to the public. I would say probably by the end of this month. Um, and I want to thank uh, Council Member Sterner and also um, Council Member. Member Wolf, who I don't think is on this committee, but um, they graciously invited myself to participate in the uh, TAC member appointment process. So uh, I think it went very well. I'm satisfied with the decisions we made, and I think that the the process um, um, was a success. Um, so at our meeting, uh, our December meeting, uh, we we had a so your. Um, uh, your team who does your, your travel behavior inventory survey came to us, um, in the last survey that they did, the last pre COVID survey they did, they got a response that 10% of respondents identified as having a disability, but, uh, that was as granular as the data went at that point. Um, the survey team wanted to get a little more detailed information about what sort of disabilities and who is using the system. So they came to us with questions about the questions and also questions about language. We had a, we had a quite a long discussion, um, did some, did some kind of cultural corrections on the language that was being used. Um, and I think a lot of that is going to be incorporated into the next survey that is provided. Uh, there is, I think, two extra questions that they are including on the next survey on the next survey. In addition to 
that general, do you consider yourself to have a disability? So I, I think that will go a long way in identifying uh, user needs. Um, so I'm glad that they came to us for that. Uh, we also, um, a couple other things that we did at the December meeting. Uh, we So 2022 is the 30th year that TAC has been around. So we uh, decided as a group to, in whatever form it may be, to have some sort of celebration. Um, we put together a work group uh, that will be, I think, meeting probably early next year to decide what we're going to do for for that. I think we're going to have some some history. We're going to have a timeline of TAC. Um, um, we're also going to talk about uh, maybe some contributions the TAC has made to the overall transit system. And then mainly just highlight uh, the successes of TAC, the, success, the successes of Metro Transit and the Metropolitan Council in its ability to serve folks with disabilities. And finally, um, we, we, we did, so in the past, uh, I think it's been a few years, but in the past, TAC has had some sort of recognition of drivers or operators, and we, uh, it was proposed to reinstate this. So I will be, um, I will be working with uh, a couple of our, of our staff liaisons to see how we can possibly reinstate any sort of driver, driver recognition, uh, from you know, the TAC perspective from the disability community's perspective when it comes to, when it comes to, uh, dri I use driver, you know, it could be drivers, it could be operators, it could be conductors, it could be pretty much anybody. Um, um, but we really want to, to, to highlight that. And we think that it could assist in boosting uh, morale to, of, of folks over there at Metro Transit. Um, that is all that I have. For my update, I'm happy to to answer questions and maybe provide more detail on some of the some of the survey stuff if you all so desire. Hey, thank you, David. Um, I see Councilmember Cummings has her hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Finley. Thank you so much for that report. I always enjoy your reports. It's so important to hear what's going on with your uh, committee. I think the work that you do is very very important. Um, glad to hear that you're going to put some sort of historical perspective and recognition event together. I, I would be really interested in that. So I hope you will keep us surprised of where we can access that or when or, or whatever. But again, thank you for the work that you do and for reporting in. I think it's just really, really important and it's much appreciated. Thank you for those comments, Molly. Um, are there other questions or comments from council members? Um, yeah, I just want to echo that. I, I love that you're going to look back at the successes of TAC and all of that. And I also do appreciate um, the looking to um, honor operators who, um, uh, from the perspective of TAC, I think that, you know, sometimes their jobs are tough and the more that we can do to shine a light on the good work that they do, the better. So thank you guys for doing that. I really appreciate it. Chair Barber, council members, it's my my pleasure. I know humans tend to, especially nowadays, focus on negative things that are happening in the world. But if we can at least carve out a little bit of the of the positive things, I think that would help. So I, I appreciate I appreciate your comments, both uh, council member Cummings and Chair Barber. Yeah, thank you, and let us know if we can do anything to help. So. Perfect. Uh, next, we are on to reports. Um, before we actually move on to reports, I want to have um, a, say a couple quick things. So, as you know, there is a new face, but not a new face to all of us that's sharing the screen with us today, and that is Charles Carlson. He is stepping up as his first day as MTS director. He comes to us um, from Metro Transit, where he's director of bus rapid transit projects, um, leading up to the very recent successful launch of the Orange Line, which is a great way to end up his time at, at Metro Transit. Transit, but we are looking forward to all the work he can do at MTS. MTS isn't actually new to him. He actually started his career at MTS as an intern in our, as one of our planning staff. So we're really excited to have Charles here. But before I turn everything over to Charles, I do want to uh, big, give a big thank you to Amy Venowitz, who's been serving in an acting role um, over the last few months. Um, I can tell you she has been fantastic, and um, it's so nice to have such a seasoned professional to help guide me through this work and guide us through this work. So really, Amy, I want to thank you for your time and your commitment to all of this. So I just want to make sure that you're well recognized because you deserve it. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charles Carlson for the MTS Director Report. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Council members, a few updates tonight. Uh, continuing the discussion of the travel behavior inventory that David mentioned, uh, the survey is well underway and we're seeking really good responses. We've gotten over 6,500 households uh, complete surveys and are well on track to exceed our goal of 7,500 uh, complete households. Uh, you may recall that when the survey launched in June, uh, staff shared strategies employed to reach BIPOC, Hispanic, and low-income residents uh, who are underrepresented in the sample uh, to date. We'll be sending a memo to the council that outlines the progress on those efforts, uh, but wanted to highlight a success we've had with the transit assistance program participants uh, through text and email. And we expect to get nearly 800 completed surveys from, the, uh, from this outreach. And the early results of that show that TAP participants represent a significantly higher share of households uh, with income less than 15,000 and uh, households that have at least one member who's a person of color. So. Well, more to come there, but a, a good initial step. Uh, changing gears to a couple funding items. Uh, the Transportation Economic Development Program is a program run by MnDOT that distributes about $20 million and of, a, of trunk highway funds uh, with a maximum of $5 million per project. MnDOT expects to announce uh, that the awards uh, for 2021 funding this week. And the program uh, provides competitive funding awards to construction projects on state highways that provide measurable economic benefits. So that, that news will be coming out this week. Uh, last week, the council received an update on uh, the state and invest forecast. Uh, just wanted to share uh, tonight that the year to date receipts are 332 million point five uh, to the council. Uh, which is 20.4 million above forecast, uh, which was 312. So a handful of percentage above forecast on MVES, on the MVES front. On the federal side, on December 3rd, uh, President Biden signed a continuing resolution that extends government funding at FY 2021 levels until May, or sorry, until February of 2022. Uh, so that will have the effect of pushing Congress's work more than halfway through the federal fiscal year of 2022. Uh, we'll have an information update on Metmo, uh, Metro Mobility tonight from Christine Cannon, uh, but just wanted to end uh, with a note about the snowstorms uh, last Friday into Saturday. Uh, so uh, with the snow coming, uh, Metmo advised customers of the impending storm through the website, through social media and rider alerts. And this messaging advises customers to cancel discretionary trips if they can. When riders cancel discretionary travel uh, as, as supply is reduced by the storm, uh, we, it helps us meet critical needs. Uh, so Friday's on-time performance uh, took a hit, uh, as you'd expect with a snowstorm in the east zone. Uh, within a 30-minute pickup window, we were at 79% compliance. The west zone was at 92% and south zone at 90%. So typically we're in the, in the upper 90s uh, as a system. And although the, the rides that we uh, delivered on Friday were just 14% below the previous Friday, uh, cancellations were up. So we were effective in, in canceling uh, travel where we could. Same day cancellations were 54% higher on Friday. So uh, we were able to curb demand a bit as the snow came in. That, Madam Chair, concludes my report. Thank you, Director Carlson. Are there any questions or comments from council members? There you go, a good successful first report. So uh, there you go. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Metro Transit General Manager Koistra. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I'm gonna start off with some good news. I'm pleased to report that the Federal Transit Administration has announced its approval of the Metro Purple Line to move into project development phase of the FTA New Starts program. Uh, we all know that the Purple Line is a 15-mile bus rapid transit line that is set to operate between downtown St. Paul and White Bear Lake starting in 2026. And now that the project has entered the project development phase, the Metropolitan Council assumes uh, project leadership from Ramsey County. So our thanks to our partners at Ramsey County for their help in getting the project to this point, and congratulations to Craig Moth and the project team for this important step. Uh, moving on to 
COVID update, uh, we've had 59 cases reported since the last Transportation Committee meeting on November 22. That brings us to a total of 680 employee cases since the start of the pandemic. Uh, the month of November ended with 87 positive cases. This is the second most recorded in one month. November 2020 is the highest with 137 cases, and of course this follows the pattern that we've been seeing statewide. As of Friday, 79% of, the, of the, our employees had reported being fully vaccinated. That means 2,298 200, out of 2,915. Employees who are not fully vaccinated and who perform on-site work continue uh, their mandatory weekly testing, and that's going well. So far, the program has identified over 70 cases many of which prevented uh, through testing, many of which uh, prevented worksite exposures because of a lack of reported symptoms. Um, mentioning on opera, uh, moving to operations, the service uh, changes went into effect on Saturday, December 4th. Uh, this is the same day we launched the Orange Line and the service changes have left us in a better position to deliver reliable service with new staffing levels our current operator deficit is still around 15 operators, but that's well down from 70 operators short before the changes were made. Uh, the first week of Orange Line service went well. Uh, I have ridership reports for the initial days. On, on the first day, we had 809 riders. On Sunday, the second day, we had 256 riders. On Monday, we had 655 riders. This is a great accomplishment of the project staff and staff across Metro Transit for their work in making this happen. And I want to thank, too, all the council members who attended the opening day events. It was a great event attended by a lot of, a lot of people and really appreciate your attendance to that event. Uh, also want to call out, as, as uh, Charles did, thanks to our operations and facilities staff who prepared for and maintained our bus and rail service during the big snowstorm. Uh, this past Friday night, thankfully, we had just six total accidents and 36 stuck buses uh, during the storm uh, that dropped as much as 20 inches of snow in our service area. Transit Control Center and Rail Control Center staff, staff managed to communicate out updates internally and to our customers throughout the storm. Facility staff stayed working during the storm and over the rest of the weekend to clean up the facilities for our customers. And I want to conclude by congratulating Carrie Desmond for her recent inclusion on Mass Transit Magazine's 40 Under 40 list. Since joining Metro Transit in 2018, Carrie has supported improvements to our Haywood garage, has managed the design work of our new Minneapolis bus garage, and has been, has been a leader in our transition to electric buses. So congratulations to Carrie. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Wes. Are there any questions from council members or comments? I just wanted to say um, kudos to Carrie as well, uh, being nationally recognized. That is just awesome. And also um, just really excited that we got the Purple Line off the ground and um, federally funded and, um, you know, our, our new transportation along 35W. So that's great. Any additional council member Sterner? Yeah, I just wanted to say that the Orange Line uh, kickoff was really great. I mean, the events at Lake Street as well as in Burnsville had some great conversations. And I think a lot of the riders and communities are very excited about the Orange Line opening up uh, with uh, the talk to a couple of long term riders. And I think they, you know, it was really easy to navigate. And I think they're enjoy enjoying the, the new possibilities and the frequency of service too. So thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments from council members? All right, thank you, General Manager. Next, we're on to our first item of business, which is the consent agenda. We have one item on consent. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. Uh, Chair Barber, this is uh, Sterner. I'd make a motion to approve the items on consent. Thank you. It's moved by Council Member Sterner. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Council Member Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. 
Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the consent agenda is passed. And we're on to our uh, first order of business. It's business item number 2021-346. It's distribution of 20 million of coronavirus response, coronavirus response and relief supplemental appropriate act federal funding. I believe we have Steve Peterson here to present. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. It is a mouthful. Uh, uh, we coined that as CARISA, the Coronavirus Response Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. And this is an item coming before you from TAB, uh, where it was approved in November. Um, so when when this act was passed last a year ago, last December, um, there's 20 million dollars that were was given to the MPO in the federal legislation um, to help with COVID relief. And the transportation funds within that federal bill, one of the approved uses for that was um, for transportation losses. And so what MnDOT um, did, at least in greater Minnesota, was the same approach as before you today was they looked at uh, state aid cities. So those are cities of 5,000 or more population and all the counties and looked at the, their state aid accounts so they could show losses um, were incurred. They, uh, those cities and counties were expecting a certain distribution from the state aid account and they received less because of people were driving less uh, during COVID and spending less less money. And so a similar approach for the 20 million is uh, proposed uh, for you today here. Um, the money would be administered not through the council, but through MnDOT state aids process where those local cities and counties would um, have to document where they use the money. And uh, I think a, a nice way for the council also to to put some money back into our local agencies so they can um, either bring forward projects that were delayed or replenish their accounts. Uh, so this, uh, how the distribution would, would occur is based on state aid formula, and that's shown on the last page um, of the action transmittal here today. So just as one example, um, Anoka County on the far top left here of, of the table would receive $1.5 million, uh, the city of Andover, 119000 and so on and so forth. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, I think uh, I will conclude there and just say that uh, a lot of our city and county partners certainly were excited um, about this proposal and the uh, opportunity here to to um, um, before you today to replenish some of their accounts and some of their projects. So thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from council members? All right, uh, Council Member Sterner. Yes, thank you. I just was wondering, would this help Anoka County pay their uh, their bill to Met Council with this money coming in, or are they planning to use it for other purposes? <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, that that would be up to them to tell you the truth, how they would use use that money. But um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any additional questions or comments from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-346. Cummings moves approval. Second moved by, by Chambliss. It's moved by Cummings, seconded by Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Next, we're on to business item number 2021-347. It's a release of the 2022 Regional Solicitation and Highway Safety Improvement Program for Transportation Projects. And I believe we have Elaine here to present. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Elaine Kutsukos, and I'm the coordinator for the Transportation Advisory Board. The proposed action for business item 2021-347 is that the Metropolitan Council concur with the TAB action to approve the attached regional solicitation packet, and including the Highway Safety Improvement Program solicitation for federal funding of 2026 and 2027 dollars, 
It also includes 2024, 2025 funding for the travel demand management and unique projects and to release the solicitation. I'll provide a brief overview of the process, which Steve Peterson has in the past presented more detail at previous meetings and then the public comments received. Following the award of the projects in 2020 solicitation, TAB evaluated feedback from the regional solicitation process from applicants, scorers, and committee members. Through a series of workgroup meetings in the first half of 2021, TAB developed changes for the solicitation. Updates included adding a new application category for unique projects, updating the pedestrian safety measure in the roadway applications, and increasing points for safety in the spot mobility and safety application. The draft regional solicitation and highway safety improvement program applications were approved in September and released for public comment. In November, TAB reviewed the 92 public comments received from 58 commenters. The comments were documented in the public comment report attached to the business item. Major themes within the report are 40 comments were related to the modal funding ranges with 35 of these comments requesting that investment be shifted away from roadway expansion to investments in transit, bicycle, and pedestrian improvements. Five of the modal funding comments supported increased investments in roadways. Most of the modal funding comments also commented on a need to reduce the impacts of climate change by reducing our investment in roads and reliance on the automobile. Eight comments were specifically related to investing in safety, such as safe bicycle and pedestrian facilities and intersection improvements. Four comments were related to simplifying the solicitation application process. And there were a number of comments supporting specific projects within the region. TAB members acknowledged the comments as reflected in the comments, TAB had updated the safety measures and the weighting and determined that the funding ranges included in the solicitation will allow for flexibility when selecting the projects at the end of 2022. TAB approved the final regional solicitation and the HSIPS applications for release. With that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Elaine. Um, are there questions or comments from council members? All right, then I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-347. Fredson, I'll move approval. Moved by Fredson. Is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Becky, can you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we're on to business item 2021-343. It's a contract for fuel supply for the North Star Commuter Rail Service. And we have Jeremy Spildy here. Hello, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Jeremy Spildy. Um, I'm the maintenance manager for North Star Commuter Rail. Um, I'm here today to present business item 2021-343 for the North Star Fuel Supply Contract with Mansfield Oil Company. And then ask for your approval to award and ex execute the contract in the amount not to exceed the $4,514,400. Um, North Star has been providing, sewer, uh, providing commuter rail service since 2009. This service requires diesel fuel to power our trains um, due to the service reduction, we've tried to make it transparent as possible on the amount of fuel North Star should require each year. Uh, the first year being 250,000 gallons, second year 300,000, uh, third year 400, fourth and fifth 475,000 gallons. Uh, the anticipation is that North Star will increase its service each year as a pandemic subsides and then a uh, riders return. On September 14th, the council solicited bids for a two year contract with three one-year options. Uh, the fuel price will be fixed um, per gallon with a daily opus price added to that amount. Uh, Mansfield Oil Company was the lowest responsive and responsible bid at the $4.5 million. Uh, funding for this contract is available within North Star's operating budget. Um, this concludes my presentation. At this time, I'll take any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Jeremy. Are there questions or comments from council members? Councilmember Gonzalez. 
Yes, thank you. And just for uh, my general knowledge of how this process works, um, you mentioned the oil pre price information service price index, which is tacked on top of the agreed price per gallon. Can you tell us more about what, what that entails? What's the OPEX, OPIS or whatever it is mentioned? And, and yeah. So the OPIS price is, it varies per day, per week. Um, we're given that by, I forget who it is, but I'm not real sure on what the OPIS, I know it varies up and down and that's whatever all the other com fuel contractors use as a set price to add on. Um, I'm, that's, I'm sorry, I don't have any more information than that. That's fine. Um, thank you. Yep. Councilmember Zarin. Thank you, Chair Barber. Um, my obvious question is, what if service was ended? Uh, what would happen to this contract? Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, um, per the contract, this isn't a guaranteed. Um, this isn't a guarantee that they are able to sell us all this fuel, so it's not a guarantee. Follow up. Please. Go ahead, Council Members Aaron. So, does that mean if uh, it, uh, that we're not obligated to spend the four and a half million dollars if service was ended? Madam Chair and committee members, that is correct. Yes. Okay, that is correct. thank you. Yep. All right, any additional questions or comments from Council Members? All right, then I'd entertain them. Oh, sorry, pardon me, Council Member Cummings. Sorry, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm always curious when we only get a single bid on something. Um, is there, what's the thinking? I know that it was um, adequately completed and solicited and so forth, but I, I'm just curious, what, why do you think there was only a single bid? Do you have any kind of idea about what, why that was? Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, um, procurement sent out an email to several of the vendors that were given the bid opportunity. Um, they got received a couple of responses. One response is because we don't have, on bus side, they have a fuel, like a bulk fuel tank on site. Um, at North Star, we do not have a bulk fuel tank on site. Um, the deliveries have to happen at night when our trains are here in the yard. Um, so all the vendors have to have an employee um, or hire an employee just for our service to work third shift to deliver the fuel. Um, and that kind of puts a burden on it, um, on us that way. That's kind of the, and then right now with the difficulty of hiring um, yeah. employees with the pandemic, it's hard, so it's a hard. Okay, job. that's really helpful to know, thank you. Yep. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, any additional questions? All right. Seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-343. Fredson <clears throat> of approval. It's moved by Fredson. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Hudson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Jeremy. Yep. Next, we're on to our final business item, which is business item number 2021-352. It's Southwest LRT Emergency Declaration. Um, and we have uh, Jim Alexander here to present. Hello, Madam Chair, committee members. So I have an emergency declaration related to the Southwest LRT. This is for repairs to the Curry Maintenance Facility, which is located along the alignment near Glenwood. We're just a little bit, uh, about a quarter mile southwest of the uh, target field. Uh, the Curry, Curry Maintenance Facility is owned by the city of Minneapolis. They maintain their vehicles in this facility. And uh, as uh, we are at our contractor doing construction activities outside the building, uh, there was some soil, soil settlement that occurred, causing the footing to, to move a little bit. And uh, that related into a, uh, uh, a separation along the segment of the exterior wall at the roof uh, 
at the roof line. And uh, so we needed to uh, get a contractor on board very quickly to get the roof secured. So in case it snowed, we'd, uh, we'd have the roof secured and uh, also need to reestablish the anchorage between the, uh, the upper wall and the, uh, and the roof. And so this item is, uh, is uh, that the Metropolitan Council ratified the emergency declaration for repairs to the Curry Maintenance Facility for the Southwest LRT project to Ames construction in the amount not to exceed $220,000. With that, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jim. Are there questions from council members? Madam Chair, just one question, if I may. Oh, yes, of course. It just, are there any things that, uh, any cases where this would be at the cost of the contractor and not at our cost? You know, any, uh, any mistakes or anything that would happen that would be the contractor's best, not ours? Sure, Madam Chair, committee members. Well, our first order of business was to get the building secured, and that is something that's being evaluated. We actually brought in another consultant to help us with that evaluation, so that's still to be determined. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Zern? Well, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Barber. Would it safe, be safe to say there could be potential litigation uh, going forward on this? Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, um, at this juncture, I would not anticipate that. We're actually in uh, cooperation, uh, working properly with the city of Minneapolis on this, and uh, we are, are working through the issues. I don't see uh, this heading that uh, direction, but uh, we'd be certainly uh, advising uh, the council if we are going to head that direction. But this, uh, at this juncture, we're looking just to solve the problem. Thank you, Jim. Right. Any additional questions or comments? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-352. Cummings moves approval. It's moved by Cummings, is there a second? Second by Chambliss. Uh, seconded by Chambliss, is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so that concludes our business tonight. Um, I would say that likely all four of these items can move on consent, but I would um, like to look to the committee. Do, um, do you want to bring the release of the regional solicitation to the full council? Uh, I vote yes for that. All right, that works for me. So um, items one, three, and four will go on consent as well as the consent item. And then we'll take um, item two to the full council. Perfect. Now we are on to information. So our first um, information item is a Metro Mobility update. We have Christine Kinnan here. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here. My name is Christine Kennan. I'm the Senior Manager of Metro Mobility, and I do appreciate being here today. I was thinking back, I think it's been since March of 2020, since I was in front of the Transportation Committee, and I think at that time I was probably wearing heels, maybe a suit of some type, and now I'm in a blouse and jeans and house slippers because my office is on the north side of my house and it's a little cold today so i don't know if that makes me cool or uncool to present to the coolest committee uh but here we go um first uh, next slide we could just proceed greg thanks but i give a, a update first on where things stand with our services and our staff um at our metro mobility service center at robert street we have uh 13 of our 14 telework, uh, staff teleworking. We do have one staff who is working on site, um, handling some of our hard, co hard copy mailing, our faxing, our card printing services. But other than that, the rest of our services are being supported from home offices. Our in-person services, our public facing services at Robert Street will remain suspended until the Robert Street offices open back up again. Um, in the meantime, as has been the case since the beginning of the pandemic, um, those new customers who are applying for new certifications 
or um, whose certifications have expired have been granted presumptive eligibility um, and their certifications extended until such time that we are able to open up and provide in-person assessment services. Most can be um, extended just with a review of the application, but some do require on-site assessment typically, so we've just extended their eligibility presumptively. Also, since we last spoke, four of our five service contractors have, contracts have initiated and are well into their fifth term, so we have a good stability. Although last year there was a lot, as well as the pandemic, there was a lot of um, contract onboarding um, and a move of one, a facility from a Roseville location to a St. Paul location. We now have some nice stability in the system. Um, our next contract coming due won't be until 2023. Next slide. So here's a snapshot of our uh, some of our operating statistics from last year. We had an $80.3 million operating expenditure as reported for our revenue services as reported to the National Transit Database for the first time in addition to paratransit services that included revenue service provided for the general public um, for healthcare workers as well. And the same will be the case for 2021. Our ridership um, took a hit, of course, with the COVID pandemic, 1.41 million in 2020 compared to 2.4 in 2019. Um, so far through three quarters of 2021, we're about 1.4, roughly 23% um, 20 less than the same period in 2019, or excuse me, yeah, 2019, that's right. Uh, we have 633 vehicles, about 17,500 active riders of 64,000 certified. We are serving 94 communities. Uh, we never changed the uh, service area or hours that we provided during the pandemic. Um, full service was provided. Um, uh, but our average subsidy uh, almost doubled in that um, for most of the reporting period, we were offering single seat rides. Um, and our productivity took a took a hit, and so our average subsidy is fifty three point nine dollars per ride last year, and it is average trip length of twelve point seven miles, a little bit, but that's pretty stable. Um, but again, most single seat ride. We didn't start offering uh, shared ride services again until about June of this year. Next slide. Okay, this slide really tells the story of how our core metro mobility ridership was fairly quick to start coming back after the initial stages of the shutdown were lifted. We've now plateaued uh, over the course of the last several months at about 75 to 80% of uh, what was our pre-pandemic ridership. The dips you see just in the last couple of weeks are for um, you know, the Thanksgiving and uh, the Thanksgiving holiday period. But that first, um, first month of service, we fell to 80% below and now we're almost up um, to only 20% below. What's significant too about this slide is that this shows just Metro Mobility certified customer ridership um, through, through April 2020 through August of 2021. We were also, of course, providing healthcare worker rides between our Metro Mobility rides and our healthcare worker rides. We were about uh, up to 100% of our regular ridership until we discontinued the healthcare worker service in August. Next slide. Okay, this next slide shows um, our service quality as compared to our key performance indicators of on-time performance, appointment times, and on-board times. The horizontal bar on each of the graphs indicates our contract goal which is typically higher than our uh, FTA mandated minimum for service quality. Uh, we are almost at zero with our non-ADA trip denials. We are providing pretty much all the trips requested um, above and meeting or exceeding our uh, performance requiring requirement. This year on time performance, we're about 95% um, compared to our contract goal of 93% and an FTA minimum of 90%. For appointment times, uh, we're at about 94% this year compared to a contract goal of 93% and an FTA minimum of 90%. And uh, on time, uh, on board time um, service of 98% 
um, exceeding the contract and FTA uh, minimum of 95%. Next slide. Of course, I need to include a slide about our COVID-19 response. Um, our contracted drivers, management teams, customer service staff, project administrators, really all who are supporting our service operations and our customers have worked tirelessly throughout to respond to rapidly changing information and conditions, um, updated requirements, um, and, and I wanna just uh, appreciate that. Here is just a high level list of some of our current COVID related initiatives. We still, of course, have our COVID safety requirements in place. Our bus operators, our customers are required to be masked at all times in service. Um, our operators have disposable masks on board to provide to customers who don't have one. We have passed through the um, vaccine requirement and, and weekly test requirement for anyone not mandated to our contractors for compliance and that is systemized now and that's been uh, in place since uh, middle of October. We still have in cl enhanced cleaning requirements. Uh, our drivers are required to uh, wipe down high touch locations throughout the day and each one of our buses is sanitized, sanitized every night. We still have a modified escort policy in place. What this means is our bus drivers, if they're able to confirm that our customer does not need close escort uh, for safety, um, they are allowed to uh, socially distance by six feet and just visually confirm that the passenger is getting from door through door safely. We are also still providing alternative service under our taxi contract for any customer who needs to get to a medical appointment or facility and is showing symptoms of COVID-19. As far as our COVID special services, we, um, like I mentioned before, we discontinued our healthcare worker transport in August, but we did provide over 360,000 trips uh, to, to those essential work, that essential workforce. Um, we still are offering curbside trips, which is a uh, service option that allows our customers to book a ride to a pharmacy or a quick pickup for a grocery, something like that. Have the bus wait outside for 20 minutes while they go in and pick up their items and then they can come back to a waiting bus it's much more efficient for our, op, our contractors to just schedule one bus for the for the round trip um, and it's proven popular for our customers providing over 38,000 to date we um, have discontinued our food shelf deliveries on uh, transit link is provided uh, the bulk of the deliveries so far this year, but still we have provided almost 25,000 food shelf deliveries uh, across the seven counties during the pandemic. We also still offer our grocery and goods delivery service. Our customers can book a ride for their go groceries or goods instead of themselves for free. And um, I also want to um, express appreciation to the state to for their coordination and making sure that we had good uh, access for our vehicles at the state fair website or excuse me state fair um, uh, vaccine site and then we also provided uh, um, trips for a, a state vaccination site at oakdale that was targeted especially to serve customers with disabilities next slide And of course, this pandemic has caused all of us to live and communicate within a new normal. And our remote working environment has challenged our team to look at new ways to connect with customers, um, meeting our customers where they are, if you will, and trying to continually adapt. We did send out two um, hard copy newsletters this year. Um, we typically send every six months, so we stayed on that rhythm, um, but we've also um, increased our customers' lists, subscription list of customers who would like to receive information virtually or electronically. Uh, we now have nearly 5,000 customers on that distribution, and so we're able to um, pull together kind of interim newsletters with service updates um, and keep uh, people more uh, routinely informed. We held um, two community conversations online. We had not had a larger community conversation since 2019. And um, so we were too absent from our broader customer base. 
Um, so we decided to pull together a virtual one via Microsoft Teams. So instead of the typical um, the small tables in a large room where we had small group conversations, we were able to break participants up virtually into the, um, you know, the conversation rooms or breakout sessions within the Microsoft Teams platform. So that was successful enough, although we did have some lessons learned, but that was successful enough that we'd like to do one again in the first quarter of next year. Our paratransit evaluators also initiated a virtual assessments pilot um, in August. So applicants are offered a virtual meeting to assess their eligibility for Metro Mobility certification following an application review. Much like a virtual appointment can be conducted with a healthcare provider, we're now offering that service as well. Um, we've had, uh, completed over 200 virtual assessments and we have appointment books appointments booked through the remainder of the year and into 2022. So anyone um, needing an in-person evaluation after they've had that virtual assessment, we will just grant them presumptive eligibility um, until such time when that we can come back into the offices and meet with them in person. But so far customer feedback has been positive and so um, we're really pleased with that. Next slide. So throughout all, um, our team has continued to work hard to improve our service and our system efficiency. Um, in April of this year, we finally launched our online booking platform that allows customers to book their rides online without going through their Metro Mobility provider, and it allows the users to track their vehicle as it approaches. The service um, offer has offered, excuse me, we about 19,000. Uh, customers have booked their rides to date on that uh, platform. We have also partnered with Transportation Plus, our taxi provider, to launch a customized iHeal application that will support additional requirements of our premium on-demand service contract. The new application allows any mo Metro Mobility customer to book rides directly through um, their own mobile device or computer without first going through their regular Metro Mobility provider to get validated. Um, the app works with iPhones and Android, Androids and can be downloaded from app stores. Um, it allows customers to register within the application as a Metro Mobility user and therefore receive that $15 subsidy for a ride. And it also allows customers to track their vehicle within the application. We also partnered with our IT teams to launch a web-based interactive incident reporting module, providing a one-stop shop for contractors and council staff alike. The application allows users to document, notify, and record incident data from initial report of the incident all the way through to investigative findings. So it's become a reporting tool for our NTD reporting as well. It's also a great example of efficient and innovative use of council resources because basically the application was lift and loaded, as they term it, from an existing tool in use at environmental services um, to make it useful and, and put on top of our own database, make it useful for contracted transportation at MTS. So I just want to say thanks to the development team um, and, their, and contractors for their collaboration and partnership on this one. Next slide. I also want to touch on our ongoing commitment to equity and inclusion. Um, it's a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts at Metro Mobility. Um, going back to um, the applications that we launched, both our online booking and our iHail application, um, those applications were tested by a group of customers, our blind and low vision customers, and we also partnered with our Office of Equal Opportunity to hire WECO Accessibility Services, who tested our booking application against both accessibility and user experience standards. And as an outcome of that testing, our vendor was able to fix 18 high and medium priority issues prior to launch against their base software, which really did benefit the all users of that Trapeze system um, across the country as well. So we really elevated um, the expectation for uh, that accessibility review. We also this year partnered with our LOD, MTS staff and contractor providers to 
um, produce an equity and inclusion training for our MTS frontline workforce. It's the first of its kind training um, that will be delivered, uh, developed by a, a team that included contract management and MTS staff and delivered to contracted workforce. The purpose of the training is to have a, a true conversation amongst transportation operators about the role of equity and inclusion in customer service. And the training program highlights the Metropolitan Council's perspective and expectations for equitable um, and inclusive service delivery, care for self and others for our frontline workforce. The training rolls out to our contracted driver staff this week, and we expect to train the entirety of our frontline workforce, over 800 staff in the first quarter of 2022. Next slide. As you know, uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, Metro Mobility is required to provide service that is comparable to the service offered by the region's all day local regular route bus and train system. Specifically, this means we must provide the federally mandated service within three quarters of a mile of any all day local bus or rail route in the Twin Cities with similar hours of availability. So when the regular route system is updated with new service hours or, or areas, new routes or trip times, Metro Mobility does the same um, review to align our own service with those changes. So over the last few months, staff across five departments, Metro Transit Strategic Initiatives, Metro Mobility, um, IT um, Business Systems and GIS and Communications have all worked to identify needed updates across the system. And I mentioned this today since mostly re since most recently um, changes from the or line, orange line will expand our ADA service area in the South Metro. Um, initially, we will be expanding hours and service levels to match the regular route growth. And then early next year, we'll be looking at areas where service has been reduced since our most recent update. And as those are identified, we'll, we'll um, Inform our customers through letter and informa detailed information on our, web on our website um, of any changes that may, that may impact them at least six months in advance of the changes being made. Next slide. And then last but last, not least, I want to illustrate that for just like every other transportation provider in the country, um, staffing so shortages and uh, workforce shortages uh, for our providers is is impactful. Uh, currently, we're we're running about 10% short of our ideal workforce. Um, what we're doing is um, ex it partnering with our contractors to to be innovated with recruitment um, and um, retention strategies. We're also exploring hourly contract rate increases that could be applied applied to the front line within our spending authority. Um, we know that the minimum starting rate um, as defined in contracts has not been competitive um, in the current market. And um, as a result, we're seeing um, in our largest contracts about a 39% reduction of year over year hiring um, at the, from this time last year. Um, it is becoming a little bit more difficult to meet our on-time performance goals across our sy system without our um, driver levels where they need to be. Um, so it is, it was very helpful that we are back to providing um, Metro Mobility service rather than an additional healthcare worker service, um, being that, you know, we pretty much utilizing the entirety of the workforce that we have on our own core system. And that is the last slide, but um, before I close, since I don't get in front of this group very often, I want to take the opportunity to thank and congratulate my team and um, the entirety of the contra our contracted providers team uh, for their work throughout the last two years. The amount of collaboration, communication, creative problem solving is just something I don't think I've ever experienced in my career before. Um, and um, it's to their credit um, that we've been able to provide the service that we have been um, throughout this pandemic from home. So thank you with, again, and with that, I can take questions. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, are there questions? Uh, Council Member Sterner. Thank you. Uh, just uh, the second to last slide. 
did where you talked about the service there with the orange line coming in and, and you're basically, you know, that's a lot of my area. So I'm just trying to maybe get a little yeah. more drilled down more detail. So sure. I, I have had uh, some riders that use a service in Rosemont that we haven't been able to problem solve where it is. So between like Invergrove Heights and Rosemont, where you see that area shrinking down of where the service area will be, or could you maybe get a little more detail on that? Yeah, let me clarify, and I don't want to uh, misrepresent. So what we're looking at is not a reduction of our service area on whole. We are look, we are examining what is the ADA service area versus what would be provided within a non-ADA. So if an area, and then also making sure that our service hours are roughly matching what is provided. So, um, and most of those changes would be on overnight service where Metro Transit for maybe has significantly reduced some of the overnight service, you know, we'll be examining the impact of that and, and, and making adjustments down the road six months from now for anything that would be a curtailment. But a service area right now, what we're looking at is all expansion. Um, that orange line and, and all of the related routes has really kind of offering all day more regular transit service, public transit service, and our ADA service area must align with that. And so we're actually going to be increasing that ADA service area um, in that in that region that the orange line touches. Okay. Follow up a question with it. Will it also improve our weekend uh, service as well with it or any yeah. change on weekend? You know? Yeah, anywhere their hours are improved on the regular route system will commensurately improve Metro Mobility service hours. Okay, all right, thank you very much, mm -hmm. appreciate it. Yep. All right, and just no questions or comments from council members? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Kevin, for this report. I think it's just amazing what uh, you have been able to do, what you and your team have been able to do. I think that the, the creativity, the flexibility, the commitment to the service as reflected in this presentation is, is really something, something to be very, very proud of. Um, I think it's, you. Um, you know, pivoting in short order and with shifting sands and not knowing day to day what, what is going to come around the corner next uh, and being able to take care of so many people in so many different ways that were not a part of the equation before. I mean, the, the healthcare workers, 362,000, that's incredible. And the curbside trips, the food shop, the grocery and goods, and then getting out to uh, uh, challenging populations where it's difficult for them to get the vaccines and be all the things that you were able to do, I think are pretty amazing. Another thing that I think was really important, I think all of us in this uh, pandemic <clears throat> situation have wanted as much peace of mind as we could get, which is pretty hard to come by. So I think the fact that you, you did so much communication with the users of Metro Mobility is really, really important because I think the more information, the more knowledge we may not like what we're hearing, but at least we're hearing it. So we know it. we can modify our expectations or increase our expectations or whatever it is. So anyway, your report is excellent. And I just can't thank you enough to you and your team for all that you've done during this time and continue to do moving forward because we're not out of it yet, but thank <laughs> you very much. Madam Chair, Council Member Cummings, thank you for those kind words. It is, I really want to um, echo that communications, the necessity of that as we're all working from home, we feel more isolated and it, yeah, the more types of communication that we can make available um, to our customers, the better. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Fredson. No, thanks, Chair. Um, so two quick questions related to the last slide uh, related to workforce challenges. And um, can you remind me what our uh, starting rate is right now? And then I'm curious to know if um, historically, if we've ever uh, uh, raised the, the uh, hourly rates right beyond the um, agreed to contract amounts. And if you don't know yeah, the answer thank to that you. question. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council Member Fredson. Um, so right now we have in our existing contracts a minimum starting rate of, I think it's 1775. Um, and we also put in a minimum for reservationists of 
I think it's 1580. Um, we did um, make a similar adjustment in 2016 to 2017. I think it initiated in 2016, took effect in 2017 um, to um, boost the hourly rate. And then we made it require that our contractors apply that rate adjustment to the two frontline wages. So we, we have precedent to do it. Um, so we're looking at what that would need to be now to compete in the marketplace. Um, and, uh, you know, but we're not set to, to come forward in front of you quite yet on what that would be, but that's the kind of thing we're examining and what we can do within our, our authorization. Uh, Council Member Chambliss. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Barber. I just wanted to say I'm really um, excited about the IHAIL application. And I know my mother and a lot of people in her senior apartment use Metro Mobility a lot and um, are very interested in knowing when their vehicle is going to be arriving mm -hmm. um, or not arriving. So I think that's going to be a val valuable tool that I'll definitely share. And I'm not sure how you're communicating that out to the different apartment complexes but um, or senior citizens um, how how are they aware of this tool thank yeah thank you madam chair council member champs uh so what we've done is um we've put information in our newsletters and our um, online subscriber lists um, about the the launch of the application beyond that we have not targeted um, any residences or apartments. So someone would have to be in receipt of our, typically in receipt of our newsletters to um, to have, you know, to have received the communication directly. Otherwise, the information has been updated on our website. If you go to the metromobility.org website um, and click on that service, it will give you a page of um, information about that service. And, and how the application functions and who to call for more information. Great, thanks, Christy. You're welcome. Right. Any additional questions or comments? I have two, if there's none. Um, uh, number one, really just wanted to tell pretty much everything um, Molly has said about uh, how impressive the response to COVID-19 and how you we were able to get creative with service and and helping people with the healthcare trips and the food shelf deliveries and you know it's uh during the pandemic everyone looks to the helpers and you guys are the model of the helpers so thank oh, you thank, thank you, you. Thank and you. then um just another thing i wanted to mention so um at I served on the Metro Mobility Task Force a few years ago, and um, what I can tell is we came out with a list of recommendations um, to help improve service and accessibility and efficiency. And I just want to commend you also because you see that woven throughout all of this. And when I look at the slide with the key performance indicators and such a low rate of denials and some of these things, especially as our service is ramping up, uh, it's really, really quite impressive. Um, I mean, that was a big undertaking um, several years ago, but you can definitely see that um, you and your team have taken that to heart and kind of wove it throughout everything. So very impressive. Thank you, Chair Barber. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, well, I think if there's no more hands, we can let you go. So thank you, Christine, very much. Um, we can move on to our next information items, which is a better bus stops update. And we have Barry Farmington and Paul Lamb here, I believe. Thank you, I'm Barry Farrington, and I'm here with Paul Lamb from the Engineering and Facilities Department. And we're here to update you on better bus stops progress over 2020 and 2021. Better Bus Stops works to improve the customer experience at the bus stop through transit information, accessible boarding areas, pedestrian connections, shelters, and maintenance of those shelters. And many Metro Transit departments work together on the program. Better Bus Stops began as an equity initiative and continues to focus on access to opportunity for all. First, I'm going to highlight the impact the program has in serving customers and review the program's racial equity metrics. And then Paul will cover recent capital project progress and other programmatic improvements. Next slide, please. So first, why is it important to put attention and resources into bus stops? This chart shows the average weekday bus boardings by passenger facility type and whether under pre-pandemic conditions shown in the yellow bars or our current ridership in the red bars, 
you can see that sheltered bus stops have higher use than any other category of passenger facility. Sheltered bus stops are where bus riders access the system the most. And there are nearly 900 shelters across approximately 12,000 bus stops in the system. Next slide, please. Better Bus Stops was initiated in 2014 as one way to demonstrate the agency's commitment to racial equity in response to community members. Metro Transit received a competitive federal grant to launch the work. Equity focused neighborhoods where the majority of residents are people of color and experiencing low income were established to prioritize where shelter investments would be made and for community engagement. So Metro Transit working with nonprofits, Nexus Community Partners and the Alliance and Cura at the U, we contracted with 11 community-based organizations to spend a year learning from community members about their bus stop priorities and their experiences. So within that focus area, we have achieved the goals to add 150 new shelters at bus stops that didn't have them previously and to improve over 75 existing shelters with light or heat. Using what we learned from the community engagement process, we updated our shelter placement guidelines, which set the priorities for shelter locations. So with these targeted capital investments, shelters, light and heat are available at similar or higher rates in that equity focus area compared to the rest of our service area. Next slide, please. This chart shows the share of bus boardings that happen at bus stops with shelters shown in blue, light, in yellow and heaters in red. System-wide, we see the availability of shelters, light and heat has increased every year since 2016, which is when we started measuring these outcomes. In 2020, over 65% of boardings occurred where there are shelters, 42% where there's light and shelters, and 32% where there's heated shelters. These increases reflect investments at bus stops and A-line and C-line stations. We also look at these measures by race and ethnicity with the goal that bus stops in racially diverse neighborhoods continue to have shelters, light and heat available at similar or higher rates as compared to the system average. So now we'll look at the equity metric for shelters. Next slide, please. This chart shows the availability of shelters by race and ethnicity over the past five years. And the measure looks at the racial demographics of people who live within a 10 minute walk of each bus stop in the system and then weights those demographics by the boardings at the bus stop. And these racial and ethnic groupings shown here, Black, Hispanic, Native American, other racial groups, White and Asian American, these are set by US Census data. So over time, we see an upward trend for every group with more pronounced positive changes for Black, Native American and Asian American groups. In 2020, at the far right of the chart, we see Black, Hispanic, Native American, and other groups have a rate of shelter availability greater than the system average of about 65%. And in 2020, we see Asian Americans have a rate three percentage points lower than the average. And we see that difference has narrowed significantly from 2016 to 2020. So we checked this outcome for Asian Americans uh, in the metric at the bus stop level. And we found this rate has more to do with ridership patterns and residential patterns and we didn't find a lacking of shelters at high boardings bus stops located in predominantly Asian American neighborhoods. Overall, the 2020 average for Black, Indigenous, and people of color was 68.4%, which is above the system average. And the trends are similar for light and for heaters. These metrics align with the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act analysis that was presented at your November meeting. And we see the strategy put in place with better bus stops to focus shelter capital investments within neighborhoods where the majority of residents are people of color has worked to address gaps. And so as we continue to invest in bus stops across the system and service area, we continue to keep our attention on these equity metrics. Next slide, please. So looking to our future goals, we maintain that racial equity goal and we've added goals focusing on accessibility and this means removing obstacles, creating clear spaces at bus stops, constructing concrete boarding areas, and investing in pedestrian access at bus stops. So while accessibility capital projects have been part of Metro Transit's work for years, the intention is to set accessibility as a forefront priority for the program. And through the capital program, we're prioritizing accessibility where we have shelters. We're setting bus stop accessibility as a measure to track progress, 
We're putting more attention to partnering with construction projects by others so that when street reconstruction or development projects have bus stops within their construction limits, um, those projects will result in accessible bus stops. So now Paul's gonna give you some more detail about recent capital investments. Thank you, Perry. Uh, next slide, please. As Barry mentioned, the Better Bus Stops program is a multi-year effort, and I'd like to give the committee an update on investments and improvements we've been able to make the last two years. Uh, in 2020, we were able to add 15 shelters uh, to the system and in equity focus groups to achieve the program goal of 150 new shelters within equity, equity focus neighborhoods that Barry mentioned. We're also able to replace 22 old shelters that were ended the, at the end of their useful life uh, and added 25 concrete boarding pads to make uh, boarding and alighting the bus at the front door of the bus easier. In 2021, we focused more on replacing aged shelters as we had a number of those that were coming up on the 20 year end of their useful life. We we're able to replace 48 of those uh, we're also able, by the end of this year, we'll have 11 new shelters at bus stops that did not have shelters previously and add 22 boarding pads. Uh, I'd also note with these numbers for the 2021, these are just for regular route service. This doesn't include any improvements from other capital projects like the Orange Line or D-Line construction. Next slide, please. Uh, and as I mentioned, we focused more on uh, replacing shelters this year. And as part of that effort, we looked at increasing the pedestrian accessibility around the shelter at, at the bus stop overall as we replaced those. Um, on the pictures on the right are an example of a shelter at uh, East 7th and Hope, where the green shelter on the picture on the left has a, is a six foot depth. And then we replaced it with one with a four foot deep sidewalls, but it still had a six foot roof. So it'd still be the same roof coverage. We did that to make sure that there was at least a five foot pedestrian route around the shelter um, so that people walking or rolling could get around the shelter and access the bus stop and be able to bypass the bus stop on their way down the sidewalk. Uh, with, of the 48 shelters that we were replaced this year, about a quarter of those we were able to make um, accessibility improvements either like this or for older shelters that had a full length bus or a bench at the back putting in a half a bench or the new shelter replacement would have a half bench to allow people as to, customers to fully get in the shelter especially people with wheeled devices and get completely under the roof of the shelter uh, and then also this year working with uh, the procurement department of the council and the office of equal opportunity and using programs such as MCUB Select, we were able to award two of the three improvement construction contracts to MCUB contractors. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the capital improvements, we were able also did a number of maintenance improvements this year. Um, to save costs, speed up repairs, and to improve customer safety, we started using um, clear glass instead of the traditional frit uh, pattern glass. Um, we can get uh, clear glass a lot faster, months faster than frit glass uh, because of the frit glass baking and production process. Um, so this change allowed us to really speed up repair of broken glass. Uh, we're going to be continuing this going forward. It'll be phased in over several years uh, and shelters will be addressed uh, based on the need for repair and then with installation of new or replacement shelters overall. This year, another maintenance improvement, we were able to uh, start testing out, putting in uh, art in shelter glass to deter breakage and provide visual, visual interest in the community. Uh, Mark Ranlin from the Engineering Facilities Group gave a presentation on the arts program to this committee a couple of weeks ago, and this is one of the aspects and one of the pilots from that. Uh, the fish on the shelter in the lower right-hand corner uh, is on a shelter at Maryland Avenue and Clarence Street near Lake Phelan in St. Paul. Our maintenance department was also able to hire additional staff this year to clean and repair shelters and to make the customer experience at the shelters at shelter bus stops better overall. 
And then finally, Metro Transit relaunched its adopt a stop program uh, where community members have the opportunity to volunteer to help freshen up a local bus stop, a shelter, or transit station through litter pickup and by giving them a contact and maintenance facilities or facilities maintenance to uh, call about more urgent maintenance repairs. Uh, next slide, please. And as Barry mentioned earlier, we are looking at uh, making resor more resources available to collaborate with external partners. As I mentioned with the relaunch of the adopt to stop program uh, on our, we provided more information on our website about the program, as well as online application forms. Previously, they used to be just uh, paper forms. Um, and then Additionally, in collaboration resources, every year Metro Transit staff is asked how to accommodate bus stops when roadways are rebuilt or buildings are being constructed. This year, Metro Transit published a bus stop design guide on its website to assist partners, whether those be cities or counties working on roadways or private developers working on buildings, um, to include bus stop designs in their projects and also to make sure to provide designs that are accessible bus stops and work for operations, both for our riders and for uh, bus drivers. Uh, the image on this page is from that design guide showing a bus stop at a near side of the intersection. Next slide, please. And with that, thank you for your time. And Madam Chair and Council members will ask to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Barry and Paul. Um, all right, any questions or comments from council members? Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you very much. And and just a question about the uh, the great work that you've done so far in, and that you uh, share with us during your presentation. But I'm wondering how much of that is going to be embedded embedded on the way the uh, the council do, does its works in the future. Um, what I'm getting at is that we see a lot of a lot of what you mentioned was retrofitting uh, improvements to uh, shelters that were already constructed. But can we kind of think ahead so we don't have to retrofit stuff if we do it? Um, if we apply the lessons that we learned so far, uh, you know, consistently and, and thoroughly from now on that yeah chair and council member that's a very good question um in terms of applying these moving forward uh the the discussion about clear glass was had with the brt group and that is something that we included in the most recent local route shelter procurement but the brt group is going to be including in um future actually i think their current shelter BRT shelter construction package, as well as Gold Line and other BRT lines moving forward. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the um, older shelters had full length, ben full length benches uh, to provide, I guess, spaces for more people to sit. That's something that the last two or three local route shelter contracts that we've had, we have discontinued that and do have uh, shorter benches to allow people to wheel fully under into that. Um, into the into the shelter area. So those are some things that we are we've already um, integrated into current contracts and are looking at uh, carrying that forward. Barry, are, are there any other examples you can think of? No, I was just I was just wondering about that part of the process, especially since the gold line is going to be expanding into uh, District 12, which is my district. So I just I was just hoping that those new um uh ideas and practices will be incorporated in the future as we expand and create new lines uh, in addition of course to retrofitting the old ones so thank you thank you additional questions or comments councilmember cummings thank you madam chair i just want to say that i think that uh the bus stop is is the beginning of the experience the transit experience for those who are using transit and we're trying to increase ridership bring back old riders and encourage new riders and i think that this program is so important and i love the steps that you're taking it to make it um, nicer 
for while we wait for our bus. Uh, and I really love the artwork. I think that's really, really important. So thanks what you're doing for what you're doing and thanks for the report. And see, we have council member Sterner. He has this hand up, but he's got. Okay, thank you. I hope okay. you can hear, hear me. Yep, um, you can. We could hear you. This with uh, our, our, our people with uh, disabilities as well. So it's uniformity and the structures easy to get around, especially with our blind and visually impaired uh, uh, folks and other things. So I think it's, uh, will make it where, you know, they can find the ones that it's, it's uh, very accessible for all of our riders in. So, so thank you. That's good. Very good. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you very and Paul for all your work and thanks for coming and reporting to us here. It's always nice to get these reports every year to see what the progress that we're making. So much appreciated. All right, we're going to move on to our final uh, information item. We have development treads along transit report. We have Amy Yoder here to present. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Amy Yoder. I am a planner in the transit oriented development office at Metro Transit. Uh, so I'm presenting today on the 2021 development trends along transit report. This is a report that our office has been putting out for five years and three years in this format. So it might be a little bit familiar for folks. We'll see. Um, one thing to keep in mind as we go through the report is that this is focusing on data up to 2020. Primarily, I will be doing a short preliminary uh, COVID-19 impact analysis, but the bulk of the data in this report only goes up until 2020. Uh, next slide. Starting off with some basic definitions for this report, this is focusing on high frequency transit, which is local bus, bus rapid transit, and light rail transit that operates every 15 minutes or less um, on weekdays between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m., and then on Saturdays between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Within that definition, uh, both the North Star and the Red Line Transitway do not qualify as high frequency transitways. Uh, so those won't be included in this analysis, although our office is exploring some different uh, ways to look at those transitways as well. For this report, we're focusing on multifamily residential that is two units or more and is new construction. Most of the uh, permits that are included in this report are for multifamily developments with five units or more, um, but we do include everything down to an ADU. The other types of development that we're looking at are commercial, which includes renovations, uh, public and institutional, and industrial, also including renovations. Within those, we will not be looking at airports or any utility projects like transportation transit projects. Next slide. Um, with these uh, transit ways that we're exploring for these development trends, we look at them uh, temporally as well as geographically. So by looking at developments that are permitted after a project enters a certain stage where it's relatively certain that it's going to happen, we can make some um, assumptions about how the development community might be thinking about transit as that's happening. So this uh, slide shows the different years that we look at each of these transit ways for. Um, so blue line 2003 up to more recently the gold line starting in 2018. Uh, where we look at uh, high frequency local bus routes, if there's a high frequency transit way that comes in after a high frequency local bus route was already qualifying, the point uh, prior to the new transit way will count for high frequency local bus, and the point after the new transit way will count for the orange line or whatever that will be. Um, next slide. 
This map shows the general areas, the buffer areas along the high frequency and transitway routes, the large capital projects, in addition to the quarter mile buffer um, surrounding those high frequency local bus routes that are included. This land area makes up just 3% of the seven county region by land area. And then on that land area in 2020, we saw 30% of the regional development value was permitted for areas near high frequency transit. Now, next slide. This is where I'm going to go into a very brief, very preliminary uh, look at how the COVID-19 pandemic May seems to have lots of kind of uh, qualifiers there, might be impacting development in the region. This first slide shows a graph using those regional permit data um, from the Met Council that have been used throughout this report and have been used in the past. Going from 2009 to 2020, both development near high frequency transit and development in the region was on a pretty steady positive upward trend until 2019. However, in 2020, there's a pretty significant drop, both near high frequency transit and in the region generally. Uh, so it's a little over 4 billion, I believe, for the regional total um, in that point. That's to be expected, kind of what we assumed and what we had been seeing anecdotally in development around the area. So we wanted to look at any other outside data sources to try and get a better understanding of what that impact might have been and whether or not the region appeared to be recovering yet. So next slide. <laughs> Pardon. Uh, we looked at Dodge construction data um, and performed our own internal analysis of some of this kind of generalized construction reports and permit values that are values that are coming out of that data source. Uh, this is looking from 2019 on by quarter. 2019 was actually a bit of an outlier of a year, so those totals are fairly high. Um, of note to me, you see, in, or the graph shows in dark blue, the bottom section of the stacked bar chart, high frequency transit was a very high percentage of construction occurring in 2019. Then the expected drop off in quarter one of 2020, both regionally and within high frequency transit areas, just kind of kneecapped. Development drops way down. A bit of recovery in quarter two. And then as the pandemic begins to set in, in 2020 and quarter three, lower values of construction going in both near high frequency transit and the region. Most uh, Positively, most hopefully, we can look at uh, 2021 in quarter two, where uh, construction values in the region appear to be recovering at a very, very large rate. So people are building, 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 building. Uh, we want it, uh, next slide, please. As part of this kind of preliminary analysis of the COVID-19 impact, uh, I specifically wanted to look at multifamily residential housing and how that seems to have been being impacted. Uh, again, anecdotally, it seems like perhaps residential development might have been recovering sooner than some of the other types of development. So this chart shows the Dodge construction values uh, just for apartments in the region from 2019 to quarter three of 2021. Once again, seeing really high percentages of that construction value going in near high frequency transit um, and continuing to be high, a high share near high frequency transit throughout the period that we're looking at. Once again, seeing kind of that recovery starting to happen in later 2020 and speed up in quarter two of 2021. So finally, for this preliminary analysis, we can't draw any uh, strong correlation or causation arguments, but we can see that development, construction, it's coming back. Why is it coming back? That's, that's the part that we can't make any statements on, but the numbers do show that construction is recovering in the region. Next slide. 
sorry, I have really bad allergies, so I'm like trying not to cough constantly. <clears throat> Moving into the kind of traditional portion of this report, looking at developments that we're seeing in permitted data from the region. Since 2003, we've seen $15 billion permitted development value along high frequency transit. That represents 39,200 multifamily units that have been permitted near high frequency transit, which is 39% of the multifamily units in the region. All told, that's 35% of total development value on that just 3% of land area. Uh, the chart at the bottom of this slide shows some of those of their raw form. Um, for residential, we're looking at 41% of the regional development value being near high frequency transit, commercial 39%, public and institutional 28%, and then industrial 7%. Next slide. This graph shows uh, regional development values near high frequency transit from 2009 to 2020. It's a bit of a complex chart, but I wanted to share this with you because it allows us to see both the regional tonal trend near high frequency transit, which is that line that has kind of a positive trend up and then the drop in 2020 that we'd expect. But also this chart, this graph shows residential, commercial, public institutional, and industrial value each separately. So you can see those, those trends and those totals operating independently. One thing that I'd particularly like to draw your attention to is that commercial development value near transit was showing a positive trend up to a uh, peak in 2017, and then actually began dropping from 2018 to 2020. So there was already a negative trend there that could impact or could be a complicating factor for that regional drop from 2019 to 2020. One question that we have to ask about things like this um, is whether or not any of that negative trend could come from differing ways of defining these terms in the permits. So that's something that we'd like to explore a little bit more is that the, there's a lot more mixed use development where people were filling out their permits as residential rather than as commercial. And is that a complicating factor? Um, but we still, within the permit data, are seeing this negative trend that peaked in 2017. So that's that's a really interesting thing for us to know. And it's a question that we're going to try and dig into moving forward. Um, one note on this, uh, in 2014, this data does not include um, the construction of the US Bank Stadium. That construction might appear in some of the other charts. So if you see 2014 popping up as a really big outlier, that would be the construction of the US Bank Stadium. Next slide. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, so this slide shows one of the many maps that are included in the full report, showing multifamily residential value from 2009 to 2020 along these high frequency transit ways. On the map, you'll see some dots are a saturated kind of orangey color and some are faded out. The saturated dots are those which are within both the geographic and temporal bounds for the report. So those are the ones that are um, counted as being within transit wave borders. We didn't include as many maps in this presentation as we have done in the past, partially because a lot of the trends are fairly consistent. So with most of the development in the region, you can see kind of consistent clustering in downtown Minneapolis, downtown St. Paul, somewhere around South Bloomington, and then near, near the transit waste established corridors. Um, one thing that I found really interesting with a lot of these is the high frequency lo local bus routes that are under consideration by Metro Transit for future uh, capital investment often already show significant investment in development near those routes. So that's something really positive um, that we can look forward to as our high frequency network expands. Next slide. <clears throat> Within this report, we also attempt to look at planned development in the region. 
The plan development section and data is drawn from the council's development monitoring data set, which primarily looks at media. So there is uh, kind of a selection bias to what stories and what developments end up in the media. Um, so you can assume that this plan development report and the highlights I'll be presenting here and in the report probably underestimates the ultimate development that we'll see in the region, but it does give us kind of something to go off of. This year we found 9.5 billion in development that's planned along high frequency transit routes. 58% of that is mixed use. So that's commercial and residential developments. Uh, this represents 67% of the total development planned in the region with 6.1 billion going in near LRT stations and 5.4 billion going in near BRT stations. This year, we're seeing 35,200 multifamily units that are planned near multi or, pardon, near high frequency transit. That makes up 45% of the units planned in the region. Um, next slide. One of the things that I wanted to pull out and focus, although the report will have further maps and more information on the planned developments that we're seeing in the region, is the extent of mixed use sites along both new and upcoming high frequency transit ways and established transit ways. Uh, so this map shows uh, yellow dots that are near high frequency transit routes that show mixed use developments. Uh, there's a number of new planned mixed use sites near existing transit ways like the green line and the blue line, in addition to some going in near the green line extension the orange line, kind of all of these different transit routes, both new and old, just amazing amounts of mixed use development that's making the news and is planned for the region. Uh, finally, next slide. I wanted to do a spotlight on one of our BRT routes that's kind of been established for a while. So we looked at the A-line BRT. Um, the data for this goes back to 2014 um, and up to 2020. In this slide, we've got kind of a picture of one of the new developments near the A-line and general summary of some of those key statistics about the A-line. Permitted since 2014, we've seen over 1,300 multifamily units, and we have another additional 6,000 units planned near the A-line BRT in the coming years. Uh, kind of doubling the amount of residential development value that is expected there. Um, near the A-Line BRT, we've already seen over $300 million um, dollars in commercial value that's permitted near that line um, and increasing the amounts of both mixed use and public and institutional value as well. Next slide. Just an update for all of us, um, the A-Line BRT opened in June 2014, so we actually saw a pretty significant investment in units prior to opening. So in 2014, as the chart shows, there was almost 300 units permitted near the A-Line BRT. And then in 2018, another kind of jump up of units being invested or being built in this area one of the things that I wonder about with this kind of 2014 initial investment in residential units and then a bit of a lull and coming back is perhaps this was an example of having a line build up a little bit, build that kind of transit oriented community, community is the corridor, um, more connections to more destinations, getting going as the line is established. Can't draw causation there, but it's interesting. Um, I'd also note that the US Bank, or pardon me, um, the MN United station or stadium was getting started and getting established around the same time. So there's there's interesting things that were happening there with the development of the line and with its popularity. Um, I did find information showing that we had 94% on time performance in 2018 with the A line BRT, which is just super cool to me. I have a lot of friends who live around there and they really appreciate the A-line. Um, next slide. So finally, 
the development trends report this year and in past years has shown concentrated growth along high frequency transit, particularly as the transit network has grown and become more established. 39% of multifamily units built in the region uh, are located near high frequency transit and 35% of the total regional development occurred on that 3% of regional land area that constitutes the high frequency transit area. We're also anticipating 30, uh, an additional 35,200 units of multifamily housing coming in on that 3% of land, um, which is just gonna be really great for our transit network and for our transit con connected communities. And that's it from me, next slide. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you, Amy. Uh, any questions or comments from council members? Council Member Sterner. Yes, thank you. Great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, early on in the presentation, you, you talked about like the red line and the North Star. I'll add that one, but you know, my ingo is the red line. The, the frequency is not there, and I'm just kind of wondering, is it kind of like a chicken and egg argument? Like if you do transit-oriented development, will improve our ridership on it? Or do you need to have the ridership to to make transit oriented development uh, work? And then maybe just in general, can you tell like why the red line isn't? Uh, is it just a matter of the density and the number of riders, or is it promotions, or where the route is? Why the ridership isn't growing, or or fits the your standards? Uh, sure. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Council Member Sterner. Unfortunately, I think that question probably goes beyond the scope of my office and this report. Um, I know that those decisions about frequency were made before I joined Metro Transit. I believe that my supervisor is on the line if he wants to jump in on, uh, Michael Krantz, if he wants to jump in on that, but that's, that's probably beyond the scope of the report for right now. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, Michael Kranz, I'm the acting program manager for the TOD office. Um, as Amy mentioned, we're, we're really just focused on where we have existing high frequency transit uh, and taking a look at what sort of development trends we're seeing there. Um, but in terms of the relationship between the red line and uh, TOD, I, I don't think there's any reason we couldn't see and don't see TOD along the red line. Um, but yeah, the, the service decisions that that really comes from Metro Transit service, uh, service planning group. All right, uh, Council Member Fredson. Thanks. Yep, having uh, uh, I represent the western half of the city of St. Paul, and I mean, you look at the two streets that have changed just so dramatically over the course of the last uh, five or six years or more, and it's been University Avenue, of course, with the Green Line, and then uh, Snelling Avenue with uh, ABRT, and um, it just uh, uh, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, you know, folks being able to live uh, close to transit, hop on, go to work, uh, the amount of new small businesses that are popping up um, in those corridors is just amazing. And I uh, look forward to seeing the same thing play out with the B line. And um, we can't get more of these uh, high frequency transit lines uh, built and moving forward. So thanks for your presentation. Thanks for those comments. Uh, additional comments or questions from council members? I'll just Council um, Member Chambliss. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm interested in maybe looking at the job opportunity numbers to people living along, especially along the BRT stations or even the LRT stations. Um, are we going to be looking at that type of data as well and, um, as, as it pertains to correlating with new development or enhanced development? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Council Member Chambliss. I believe that the Met Council's research uh, team out of community and development has presented on some of those numbers. Um, they're working with some of the same 
data sources that we are, but they do take a more uh, regional perspective on some of those analyses. We haven't looked specifically at job access along with this report. However, the TOD office is exploring different ways of looking at uh, destinations along transit. So that is something that we can uh, consider looking at in the future. Well, thank you. I um, I think just kind of looking at it alongside uh, this data would be quite eye opening and, um, you know, just kind of show us how the development act affects quality of life and um, wages, job opportunities, those types of things. Because I know a lot of times, you know, we're talking about what happens with um, gentrification. Um, and I've often thought of, well, if a area is gentrifying, um, are the wages and uh, employment opportunities improving for people who live uh, close to those corridors so that uh, their income keeps up with uh, their rent or the cost of uh, owning a business in those areas. Uh, one thing that I can say on that is that we, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's certainly something that I think about personally a lot. Uh, the TOD office did just this year get access to some new affordable housing data. Uh, so that report on affordable housing will be coming out shortly, hopefully, as we dig into it. Um, I'll, I'll try and talk to uh, community development and research and see kind of where that connection between development and access to jobs and living wages and all of that conversation is going. Thank you. Very good. Any additional questions or comments? Oh, thank you for this presentation. It really shows, I would say, that, you know, how that, the, what a big impact to the region this investment in these high frequency um, transit lines are, what it really does to to the region. So it's very, I take, appreciate you guys taking the time and digging into it at this kind of level. It really kind of relays the significant impact. So much appreciated. And I feel your pain on the allergies, so I, we're good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and um, so with that, that's the end of our um, our work this evening for Transportation Committee. I still don't have final confirmation that we won't have a meeting on the 27th, but I would not expect it. But again, I'm not going to guarantee it until I get final word, but it is the first time this group will be together before the holidays. So happy holidays to everybody. And thank you all so much for all your hard work this year. It's much appreciated. And that's both to the staff and the council members. So. Thank you all, and with that, we can be adjourned. Have a good evening.